Like most other authors, Tolkien had a lot of real-world influences for a lot of his writings. His youth in the rural midlands of the UK largely inspired the Shire. The Valley of Lauterbrunnen in Switzerland was his inspiration for the Valley of Imladris, and the Dead Marshes were inspired by Tolkien's horrific experiences in the Battle of the Somme. But one of the strongest real-world parallels that people draw is that Gondor must have been inspired by the Roman Empire, or more specifically the Eastern Roman Empire, commonly known as the Byzantine Empire or Byzantium. I'm mostly going to call it Byzantium to make it easier, so just remember that when I'm talking about the political entity that existed from 395 to 1453 AD. There are, in fact, a remarkable amount of similarities between the two nations, so what are they? And before I get started, I just want to point out that Tolkien never definitively states that Gondor was inspired by Byzantium. He does once refer to Minas Tirith as a Byzantine city, but apart from that, he actually refers to Gondor as more like other nations. In Letter 211, he says that the Numenorians of Gondor are best pictured in Egyptian terms, and that the tall crowns of their kings more resemble the headdresses of ancient pharaohs. Likewise, in a letter in 1955, Tolkien describes Gondor as Italy and describes Pelagir as Venice, the province of Losanac as a city. Furthermore, Gondor's latitude and climate is comparable to northern Italy's. But as I said earlier, even if Tolkien wasn't directly inspired by Byzantium, or at least not enough to make heavy mention of it, it may still have subconsciously inspired him. So just what are these similarities? Number one, the Sister Kingdoms. Byzantium and Gondor both used to have sister kingdoms, the Western Roman Empire and Arnor. The Roman Empire split at the end of the crisis of the 3rd century. One of the main reasons is that it was simply too large and unwieldy to be ruled by just one man. Although the split is retroactively defined by historians, the split became rather practical as the Western Roman Empire disintegrated in the 5th century, while the Eastern Roman Empire prospered. Western Rome was the economically weaker and less populous of the two sides, and also had a colder climate. Does this sound familiar? Because it should. The exact same thing happened to Arnor and Gondor. Originally ruled by one man, the kingdom split at the start of the Third Age following the death of Isildur. Whereas Gondor prospered, Arnor declined and was eventually destroyed. In the cases of both Byzantium and Gondor, they far outlived their sister kingdom. Number two, the plague. Now, this might come across as a bit of a reach. After all, plagues were relatively common back before hygiene and proper medicine was a thing. Unlike now, where a plague would be impossible. It could never happen, not in a million years. Anyway, whilst recently achieving great victories, both Byzantium and Gondor were struck down by a devastating plague of the likes that had never been seen before. The Plague of Justinian and the Great Plague. In Byzantium's case, Emperor Justinian had managed to reconquer much of Italy and North Africa, which also sort of bankrupted his empire, but it looked great on the map. In Gondor's case, Yarmendekil II had recently scored a massive victory over the Haradrim, and his grandson, Telemnar, was preparing a deal with Umbar. However, just as both nations seemed poised to retake the glory of their ancestors, they were struck down by a pandemic that would kill off huge percentages of their population. The huge death toll both nations suffered would ensure that they would never truly recover their strength, not even centuries later. Number 3. The Enemies Byzantium fought many enemies throughout its existence, the Vandals, the Bulgars, the Persians to name a few, but the two enemies who did the most damage were the Arabs and the Turks. Likewise, Gondor most often found themselves in battle against the Easterlings and the Haradrim. Note, this may seem like cherry picking, but the characteristics of both nations' enemies are pretty similar. The Arabs invaded from the south, from the desert sands of Arabia, and later used their fleet to great effect. Oddly enough, the Haradrim also invaded from the south, from the desert sands of Harad, and later used their... Well, it wasn't their fleet technically, but the Umbar and the Haradrim were very closely allied, so it may as well have been. Likewise, the Turks were migratory tribes that often invaded westward, carving out their own empires. The Easterlings were also migratory tribes that often invaded westward, also carving out their own empires. Another thing is that the Arabs and the Turks mostly followed Islam, whereas the Easterlings and the Haradrim mostly acted in service of Sauron. And just to be clear, that isn't me likening Islam to Sauron. Another similarity is the rise of a new enemy late in the game. Byzantium had to contend with the newly risen Ottoman Empire, and Gondor had to contend with the newly risen Mordor. Number 4, the Bulwark. Byzantium and Gondor both share a unique position in regards to their geopolitical surroundings. They were both regarded as a bulwark against other foes. In Byzantium's case, a bulwark against Islam and the peoples of Western Asia. Even though, you know, the Spanish Peninsula was mostly controlled by Muslim rulers at this point, Likewise, Gondor was seen as a bulwark against the threat of Mordor and the other evil men to the east and south. In both cases, it was said that should they fall, the floodgates would open up and all of the lands they protected would fall as well. This is definitely true in Gondor's case. If Gondor falls, the rest of the Westlands were undoubtedly doomed. 
As for Byzantium, well, real life is a little less black and white. Byzantium was more or less a corpse after the Fourth Crusade, so it could be argued that they didn't really do much defending, and their enemies weren't exactly frothing at the mouth to conquer all of Europe. Once again, not so black and white. But, to be fair, after Byzantium fell in 1453, the Ottoman Empire did conquer much of the Balkans and Eastern Europe, so there you go. Number 5. Assimilation Part of what made the Roman Empire so successful was how well they assimilated other peoples into their culture, and a major reason why they fell is because they stopped being good at that. Eastern Rome in particular would assimilate all sorts of people, Slavs, Goths, Turkic tribes, Armenians, and of course who could forget the iconic Varangian guard made up of Norsemen. Similarly, the Dunedain of Gondor would also assimilate other men, firstly the middlemen who lived west of the Anduin and in the vales of the White Mountains, and then eventually many Northmen who came south. However, unlike the Roman Empire that ended up becoming too reliant on other peoples, Gondor always maintained their own strength. And number 6. Prophecies One of the many legends that surrounded Constantinople and Byzantium's eventual fall was the legend of the Marble Emperor. This was the idea that the last emperor of Byzantium, Constantine XI Paleologos, was turned to marble as the city fell, but would eventually rise again to retake the city for the Romans and drive the Turks back to their homeland. Likewise, in Gondor, after the disappearance of King Aenor, it was believed that the king would one day return, and that the stewards would rule until that happened. Once the king returned, he would lead Gondor back to its glory days of old. This ended up becoming true in Gondor's case, but as for the Marble Emperor, well, I'd say it's a pretty safe bet that Constantine XI will not be rising from the dead anytime soon. But hey, it's 2020, anything can happen. There's also a lot of other minor similarities as well. The impenetrable outer wall of Minas Tirith could be likened to Constantinople's Theodosian walls. Constantinople itself, springing up on both sides of the Bosporus, can be likened to the fact that Osgiliath held control of both sides of the Anduin. The general decline of the Roman civilization can be likened to the decline of Gondor. The fact that Rome was seen as the beacon of civilization is another thing that can also be applied to Gondor. One thing that I left out that people may think is somewhat similar was Gondor's civil war, which I just recently covered. Yes, Byzantium also had civil wars, so have most other nations. Gondor's singular civil war probably isn't an apt comparison to the civil wars that Byzantium had every couple of hours or so. So there you have it, some of the standout similarities between Gondor and Byzantium slash Eastern Rome slash Rome. Have you got any more that I missed? Feel free to post them in the comments. Are you a historian? Feel free to let me know how wrong I am because I'm not a historian. And if you're a Roman, I'm sorry if I offended you, but hey, I think it's been long enough to start making jokes. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. Back with War in Middle Earth next week. And remember, the Roman Empire wasn't about the destination. It was about the friends we made along the way.